I'm going to give the first of um, a series of presentations that relates to some of the research that's funded and supported by the Padgett's Association. And this is one of two presentations that's going to tell you a little bit about <coughs> some ancient forms of Padgett's disease, and specifically forms of, of Padgett's disease in medieval times that we've been researching for the last three or four years. So I'm from the University of Nottingham, and I'm a, a scientist by trade, so I'm not a, a medical um, professional, but my interest is, is in Paget's disease of bone. I just want to briefly introduce Norton Priory to you. You'll hear a little bit more about Norton Priory, I think, in the next presentation. Um, so Norton Priory is in Runcorn. It's not far from here, stone's throw, I guess. And Norton Priory is the largest monastic excavation in Europe. So at Norton Priory, there was a medieval priory founded in 1134. It lasted into the 1400s until the dissolution of the monasteries. And at the site of Norton Priory then, um, excavations within the, over the past 20 years um, have identified skeletal remains from about 130 individuals that date back to the medieval period, so the 13th to the 15th century. So here's a, a photograph of the Priory, there's a, a museum at the Priory which has been recently refurbished with funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund and also the Wellcome Trust and I would really encourage you to visit if, if you're ever in the area. It's a beautiful new building. Inside the museum as well you can see some of the exhibits and it's really, really well done. So it tells the history of the Priory um, over the, the course of two to three hundred years. Now why am I telling you about um, a museum and a Priory? Well, as you'll hear later, it turns out then that investigations in the past couple of, or past few years by um, our next speaker, Carla Burrell, and her colleagues at Liverpool John Moores University have suggested that of these 130 skeletons um, within the, the collection at Norton Priory, many of them are affected by a bone disease. And this bone disease shows some real similarities with Paget's disease of bone that we recognised today. So I just show one image of affected bones and Carla will show a lot more. This is an affected femur um, from someone in the Norton collection, so a 700 year old bone and the characteristic um, changes then you can see this is the normal bone here and this is the thickening of the cortical bone in an individual that's affected by this Paget's like condition in medieval times. And below is an x-ray image which shows these abnormal structures again that we saw earlier in Anna's first presentation. So it does look on the face of it that this medieval disorder <coughs> resembles Paget's disease of bone. Now there is this saying, if it looks like a duck and it swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, it probably is, yep, it probably is a, a lovely little duck. However, if I extend my analogy, actually this condition at Norton Priory is more like a, a duck-billed platypus. It really is unusual with respect to the features um, of, of Paget's disease, or the features that we know of Paget's disease today. Modern Paget's, as you've heard earlier, maybe affects one to two percent of those over 55 years of age. Typically, in those affected, there'll be one site or maybe a few bones affected by the disorder. Typically, it, it tends to affect people, say, over 55 years of age. But in contrast, Carla's analysis of the Norton collection has revealed these very stark differences. So it might be as many as 20% of those 130 individuals in the medieval times um, are affected with Paget's like changes. In some cases, skeletons are extensively affected. So there are cases where up to 50% of the skeleton has these bone changes. And actually, these cases are also invariably of younger individuals, so perhaps people in, as, as young as the early 20s and certainly you know, not a lot older than 40 years of age. So there are profound differences between this disorder at Norton Priory and what we, we see today as modern Paget's disease. The key question that we've been trying to, or a key question we've been trying to address in our research was, was this condition at Norton Priory really form of Paget's disease? Was it an ancient and somehow more severe form of Paget's that's different to the disorder we see um, in, in, in modern times? And we heard earlier about 
the secular changes, the changes in severity over the last 10 or 20 years, the changes we're looking at here um, are, are even more profound. They are, are really huge changes um, in extent, age at onset, and other factors uh, uh, that distinguish the conditions. So I'm going to tell you about the research that we've done and how we've actually answered this question and with some support from the Padgett's Association. But very briefly, a 30-second lesson on biochemistry. I'm a biochemist by trade. So a real simplistic representation of a cell. There are lots of different molecules in cells. And in simple terms, our DNA or our genes make proteins. And proteins are the active molecules in cells, so they make our cells function. Um, so I'm going to mention genes and I'm going to mention proteins. I'm also just going to very briefly mention another type of molecule called microRNAs. And you'll hear about microRNAs um, in Daryl Green's presentation um, in, in a, um, a few moments as well. So microRNAs in simple terms are another molecule that control how these genes express their proteins. So they regulate this whole process. So, as a biochemist, my molecule of choice are proteins. I'm most interested in studying proteins. So, what we set out to do was to say, can we analyse these ancient molecules in these ancient bones and try and find molecular evidence that this really was Paget's disease? So, this is what we term unlocking the chemical memory of ancient bones. We were fortunate to be funded by the Wellcome Trust for some of this work and also very generously supported by the Padgett's Association um, through the award of a Michael Davy Student Research Bursary. And this funded um, a research student, Anna, to do some of the work that I'll present here. So I, I have some of our, our findings, our milestone findings, summarised just on the next few slides. So the first thing that we were really excited about and, and really pleased to be able to do um, was we could extract proteins from these 700-year-old bones. They hadn't been preserved in any way, but remarkably, proteins had been preserved um, over this, this period of time. This wasn't a particularly elegant scientific experiment, the protein extraction. We just weighed the proteins, we grind them in a pestle and mortar, we take the powder of bone, and we use chemical extraction to take the different molecules out of the bones, and this um, image at the end then is confirmation for us that we were able to extract proteins that had survived 700 years um, at, at Norton Priory. So that was our, our first milestone. The really unexpected finding was when we started to analyse those proteins and we asked the question what are the proteins that have been preserved um, in, in these samples uh, from Norton Priory. So we, we used very advanced techniques to catalogue and identify the proteins um, that have been preserved in the bones. So this is my final slide. It really was a form of Paget's disease. We've achieved actually the first protein sequence based diagnosis of an ancient disease. So this was a, a, a real um, breakthrough. There's something different about the sequestrosome protein in these ancient samples to to normal or, or modern sequestrosome protein, and we don't quite know why. And we really don't know why ancient Padgett's were so common and so different at Norton Priory. And, and maybe Carla might get onto that or, or touch on that or provoke some, some questions in her talk. But I think that what, in summary, what, what we see at, at Norton Priory is some sort of precursor of modern Padgett's disease that's evolved over time. And my best guess is it's evolved in response to some unknown environmental factor. Um, we talked about viruses earlier on, but there are a whole host of other dietary and other environmental factors that might explain this, this profound change and evolution of the disease. I'm a bit of an oddball to everyone else who's given talks today. I'm an osteologist, okay, so I look at the human remains from past populations and it's sort of my job to really tell you about the demographics of populations. Um, so that forms from determining their age of death when someone passed away, if they're male or female and their stature. And this can be done on an individual basis, so like we spoke about Richard I, we can learn a lot of information about one person, or we can look at collections like the two um, sites we're going to talk about today where we can learn about the population demographics. So it's my job to sort of give you an idea of like how we can understand past lives and how people in the past lived and how they dealt and dealt with diseases as well.
So the two sites we're going to talk about briefly today is Norton Priory, which Rob's done a nice summary of already, but I'm going to throw in uh, another site as well called Poulton Chapel, which are both in the northwest area of the UK. And just for context, uh, Runcorn is just here, so we're only stone throw away from Manchester, so we're here. So again, Norton Priory here, and Runcorn, I'm um, sorry, Poulton Chapel is just here, just off the River Dee. So let's start with the Norton Priory collection. So we know it's an Augustinian Priory and it's found in 1134, and this lasts until the dissolution of all monasteries um, brought on by Henry VIII in 1536. Now this collection um, consists of 128 articulated skeletons, so these are people where it's a complete burial. But with M and I, so this is like other um, elements we found in the site, the total number is actually about 165 people. And of this, we've got a higher adult sample to children's um, ratio and um, with it being a monastic site we've got far more males here than what we have females. Now Norton Priory is very well known for their six cases of Paget's disease. So you may have seen a few publications um, in their museum displays um, so we talk a lot about these six individuals and that gives us a prevalence rate for our adult sample of about four percent so that's quite in itself is quite high. So these are our six gentlemen. They're all over the, well, all around 40 years plus, apart from skeleton 29, this individual here, who's a little bit younger. I've got him down as late 20s, mid 30s. And what you can see here, everywhere that you see is red, is the bone that is affected with the disease, with Paget's disease of bone. So as you can see, they're quite extensive. Where you see green is just where the rest of the skeleton is present. Um, I'm going to focus on this skeleton here. He's one of our skeletons who's now on display in the new galleries, um, just to show you what it is that I actually look for on the bone themselves. So here you can see an example of um, clavicle, which are collar bones, our shoulder blades, scapula, and our skull. And you can see we've got quite thickened and large bones, which is typical of what we see in Paget's disease. And one of our distinct cases is actually this enlarged and thickened crania. So if you can imagine um, how much pressure and pain this would have put on his skull and his brain, so that um, effect would have been quite noticeable on him. Continue on with this, um, Rob has already showed this lovely image of our femur from the same gentleman. And what you can see here, again, is the thickened and large porous bone that we see here has released the Paget's disease, it's quite close to the hip. But what's next is the nice normal lamella bone. So when I'm looking at bones, this is the sort of markings that I am trying to identify, trying to find. Now, sometimes we. I don't want to say lucky, but unfortunately in some cases that some bones aren't always complete. With working with archaeological remains, they've been in the ground for a very long time, so some do break. But this is brilliant for me as I can see the internal structure of the bone and see how the internal change of Paget's disease actually looks. So again here you can see this distinct um, porous and enlarged um, changes, whereas um, from this model sample you can see how this compact bone is very, um, very straight and normal. This is a normal bone development here, and you can see this is the abnormal, most like a pagetic bone. I love x-rays, so I've taken a lot of x-rays in my time for this. Um, and just following on before from um, what Anna was saying this morning, we've got that cotton wool effect that we see in the skull and pelvis bones. We've got like picture frame vertebrae in the, uh, the lower spine. Um, and I don't know if you can see, there's a tiny line there. So we actually have a fracture in his lower spine as well, but that's quite a weight-bearing joint in our skeleton. And one of the um, <coughs> most frequently used x-rays, actually this of his femur, where you can see this flame or wedge-like shape actually in the skeleton. Sorry, can you see that? So when I saw that, I was very excited <coughs> indeed. Now the Paulson Chapel collection is a little bit different. Um, it's a Cistercian order, and even though it's very close by to this abbey, we don't actually know where this abbey is located. So we're focusing on the small chapel, which is very close to this site. And this is um, an ongoing excavation, so if anyone fancies getting their hands dirty, they're still doing excavations each, um, each week. And at the moment, it's 850 individuals have actually been excavated. I'm only focusing on 726 of these skeletons from my PhD research, which I think is a large enough sample to be showing you today. Um, unlike Norton, we've got a nice 50-50 ratio between our children and adults, and between males and females, we've got a nice ratio as well. And so far, just a preliminary analysis from my um, PhD research, we actually came across two individuals with Paget's disease, which gives us a prevalence rate of about 0.5%. So at this point, it's much lower than Norton Priory, but things change with time, so I'll explain that in a minute. So these are our two skeletons for Poulton. Now, 
This is our first instance of a female skeleton. So this lady here, and this is a gentleman here. Now, the gentleman's about over 45 years of age, and our lady is about 30 to 34. So in this case, she's actually quite younger, fits under the normal, what we typically expect to see. But you can see here we've got distinct macro changes, the external change to the bone that you can see from earlier. We've done full x-ray analysis, so you can see the parotid cotton wool changes throughout the skeleton. And unfortunately for this gentleman, He's quite fragmented, he's quite broken up, the poor thing. He's been out of the ground for a long time now. And what's led to this, though, is we can actually see all the projected changes on the internal structure of this bone across the skeleton. So everywhere you see red is femurs, his arms, we can actually see these internal changes in there as well. Um, and you can see that both of them are quite extensive again. Now, I've stuck this image here because this is actually the tibia or the shin bone of this gentleman. And you'll see there's actually a slight deformity. So you can see the bowing of the shin bone, and he has that on both sides. So this is the first time I've actually come across a deformity in both these collections at this point. So you think of the extensive, um, the extensivity of this disease that they have, that we might see more of this, but at this case we don't. This is my first case. So that in itself is actually quite interesting. <coughs> So with many thanks to the Patch Association, we were awarded the Doreen Beck Student Research Bearer Series a couple of years ago now. And we wanted to use this to learn more about these eight individuals. So from these two from Poulton, the six from Norton. And to do this, we wanted to know if they were medieval and where, which part of the medieval period they were from. Because as you know, the medieval period spans about 400 years. Um, we wanted to look at their diet, we wanted to look at their location, so if they were born in the same place as they were buried, so are they actually from the northwest, are they from further afield? And we took a look at their histology as well, so not only have we done the external analysis of the bone, we've looked at the internal structure with the uh, radiology, we wanted to do some histology as well, see that in fine detail. But the Norton Priory skeletons tell me that they are dated between the 12th and 14th centuries, so we've got three skeletons with successful dates, but our two Poulton skeletons were a little bit later, so the 13th and 14th century. And the results of the dietary analysis, Norton Priory are more marine based, whereas Poulton Chapel Bay have a more terrestrial diet, uh, which is unsurprising as we know Norton Priory is more of a monastic order, there's a lot more men there, so there's a lot more religious aspect to that, so that explains why they have. Um, the higher marine contacts that you can see the blue spots there and our two Poulton individuals are here so as you can see they're much lower down. In regards to um, where they all come from, um, at this moment in time I only have the strontium off results, I'm still waiting to be given the oxygen but what's good about this at the moment that they are actually from the northwest of the UK so they're born here and um, which well the dates that we took the samples um, gives me a location where they were between the age of eight and ten years of age so we know at that young age they were definitely in this area and they were buried in this area as well. The two from Pulson Chapel are actually more along the Welsh border so more along here so they're a little bit different so even though the kind of northwest is more North Wales. Um, histology has been a little bit slow process, but you can start to see some of the internal changes here. These are just the first stages, so I'm hoping to see more on this in the upcoming months and hopefully be able to share that with you then. Now, people, some of you may have heard of my, my talks before. Um, I have highlighted that there is a plausibility of additional cases within these two collections. Um, and I've been doing my best to work with this with time. Um, I have since done my PhD, which is on a different topic this altogether, and I've just had a little girl, so I've had my hands full recently. Um, so we've been trying to do this on the side, and we've sort of done a little bit of partial radiographic analysis throughout this whole process. Um, but what I can sort of highlight at this stage is that we could have to, up to 22 more individuals from um, Norton Priory with Paget's disease lesions and um, Paulson and Chapel up to 73. So I've only been able, I've not done full radiographic analysis, I've only just been able to x-ray one or two bones, not the full analysis at this stage, but we've been able to preliminarily give an idea of what's going on. So as you can see, the prevalence rates have actually increased. So we've got 19% now, or likely 19% for Norton Priory, and likely 18% for Paulson Chapel. So that's quite an increase to what we had before. So with funding, again, Paddish Association, we couldn't be any more grateful for. I've actually supported us for our next step in our work. And at this point, we're actually um, taking a closer look at the Norton Priory collection alone. Because Paulson Chapel, as you see, there's a lot of skeletons there. So it's going to take me many, many years. I need a bigger funding body for that. So we've been able to continue this further. And with all the work that Rob's been doing, um, obviously something's quite exciting is happening. So we're focusing our additional analysis on 12 skeletons, 10 with lesions likely 
Badger's disease, two that don't show any lesions. Um, and we're going to do the full analysis again. So we're going to do the macroscopic analysis, look at the bones um, as they are, look at the radiographic analysis, again, more C14 dating, stable isotopes. And in this case, we're actually incorporating work with Anna and Rob from the University of Liverpool, who are going to do some micro CT analysis. So we can actually see the internal structure of the bones and compare that to modern samples to see, again, how this disease actually looks different um, to what we see today. So just to show so far, most of the skeletons we have selected are all males, because Norton Priory is more, it's more men here than females, but we have managed to get three females in this um, sample who show lesions of Padgett's disease. And just to show here, these are some of the lesions that we're seeing. So it's the thick and cranial vol fragments. We've got um, fibula um, changes on the, on the fibula, sorry, we've got changes in the cranium here, and on the clavicle, which we've already seen. Um, and our age ranges here vary from as early as 30 years of age right through to 45 plus. So again, we've got a large um, age range category. So we did all the x-ray analysis. Now, I don't have any pretty red and green skeletons to show you at this stage because it involves a lot of colouring in and I've got round to that just yet. But just to give a quick summary, most of the skeletons do show radiographic lesions and most of them around 25 to 50% of the skeletons are actually affected. Uh, we do have one individual here, skeleton 37, and this individual, skeleton 78, who both show quite an extensive amount of changes to the skeleton. So like we saw before on the original six, and we use that one as an example, so most of the skeletons are affected at this stage. And these are some x-rays that you can see. Now, our two control samples, which were these two here, um, kind of threw a big curveball into my whole thing. Um, these are meant to be control samples and not have Padgett's disease. Um, but when I x-rayed them just to confirm that they don't have Padgett's disease, they actually showed lesions of Padgett's disease. So that was like, great, okay, this is just what I need. Um, so what we can see here is, um, this is part of the frontal bone on the front of the skull. So you can see it's broken off here, and this is the side bones. Um, and you can see the projetic changes, and again, in the fibula as well. So this kind of... I wanted two skeletons with no Padgett's basically, and I've got another two. So even though it's great because I've got my, um, we've got more individuals here with the disease, and uh, we still need that control sample to compare them to from the same site. So back to the um, the analysis, the results. We've had C14 dates. Now these actually range. Um, a much broader period of time. So as early as the 9th century, so the um, 1020 is the earliest date we've got there, right through to the 15th century. So we've got a much broader period of time here that they're affected. Um, and one of the things I just want to point out with these skeletons, the ones that are buried much early, well, later in time, so from the 9th, 10th century, were actually more heavily affected with this disease than those who are buried later on. So there seems to be a decline within these samples so far, including the six we saw earlier. Uh, with time, there seems to be a decline in the amount of um, bones that are affected. Why this is happening, we're not too sure at this stage. But the ones here who are very, very old as such are actually buried within the cloister walk. Now, these are individuals are meant to be medieval canons. Okay? Um, so their sort of occupations back then will differ to people who are buried in the lay-by cemetery to the people who are of high status. So I think there's definitely an occupational um, input into this, but we still need to do a lot more work on that. Um, but also because obviously these are past populations, I don't know for sure exactly what they were doing. So we can speculate and have a, have a rough idea and go from there. With their diets, um, the North Priory skeletons again all fit within this medieval medieval, sorry, um, the marine-based diet. We have a few individuals who are um, so mid, like terrestrial, so mixed diet. But we do have one individual who's very high. Now, this skeleton is actually one of our, was well, meant to be our control sample. But this is suggesting me something much more higher status than what we already have in this collection. Um, we don't have the strontium or oxygen isotopes they're expected for Christmas, so a nice little Christmas present for me. Um, and hopefully at that point we can actually see if all these individuals, again, are from the local, um, local um, part of Norton Priory or Fever Field. Because with this individual, there's something interesting with him and with these two, um, it seems a little bit odd, at least for this monastic site. So just to quickly summarise, uh, we've gone from a pre prevalence of 4% for the Norton Priory collection to 12.2%, so that's been quite a nice increase based on the 12 skeletons we've looked at today. We know that the, uh, the disease were prevalent between the 9th and 15th centuries, so it's a good period of time. We know at this point there's actually a decline within the collection, so it's quite highly, um, more bones are affected 
um, in the earlier uh, phases of the um, burials, whereas the later ones seem to be less burns affected. Um, and the Pulsing Chapel, I've not, we've not done more analysis on them just at this point, but again, there seem to be um, many bones affected again. The fibula is very common, the crania. Um, so we're trying to do a little bit more now on the occupational side to learn more about what they did as people, what they did as activity lifestyles, look at muscle markers in the skeleton to sort of get better ideas to what other um, effects there are that can lead to the changes that we're seeing, especially the extent of these diseases and um, the changes from this disease. Um, but all we do know at the moment that there are more cases than we found at first anticipated and we are working to a full population review on both these sites. Um, but it doesn't stop here. I've got skeletons with one or two cases from the Spitalfields collection in London. We've got Gloucester. Uh, we've got a um, place in York as well. So we're going to try and see how this differs in other collections as well. Um, so this is my focus really in the northwest area, but we hope to expand, extend to further afield in the upcoming years, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be back at uh, Paget's Information Day, um, almost well, to the day uh, a year later, to let you know what I've been up to. So last year in Norwich, I was awarded the Alan Reed bursary. And what I'd like to do today is to tell you what I've been up to with that bursary. But before I do go into the talk, I do just want to give um, a little bit of information about who Alan Reed was. So Alan was born and lived in Glasgow. Uh, he was married to Norma and had two daughters, Pam and Jill, and a granddaughter, Sophie. Alan was diagnosed with Paget's disease in his pelvis in 2007 when he was 49, so fairly youngish. His alkaline phosphatase uh, was regularly monitored, um, and he was given two-month courses of Resigenate every 18 months, and his wife tells me that this brought his alkaline phosphatase levels down. Now, in January 2013, he started to feel pain in his shin, but he didn't think that this was anything to do with his pagets, obviously, that was in his pelvis. The residuate didn't resolve the pain, which got progressively worse, and Alan's wife tells me that he was in absolute agony, uh, a pain that was way beyond the pain caused by his pagets. In May 2013, so just a few months later, his alkaline phosphatase was measured again, and this was at 3,000 units per litre, which um, is absolutely screaming high as the maximum that you want to be seeing is 126. In June 2013, he was sent for more scans and his radiographer described what he saw was atypical pagets. There was something not quite right here. And later that month, he was diagnosed with bone cancer. And what actually had happened was his pagets disease had caused some sort of change that led on to a bone cancer, which we call osteosarcoma. But this is a very, very rare tumour. If we were going to put a figure on it, we're looking at one in a thousand patients, but in reality, it's a bit less than this, and the number is actually declining as well. Very sadly, um, Alan passed away on the 1st of August 2014, and in this light, I'd just like to dedicate this talk that I'm going to give today to the memory of Alan. So a little bit on human biology. On average, um, humans are made up of around 37 trillion cells. This is a lot of cells. Not all of our cells survive for very long, so what we have are these backup cells called stem cells, and you might have heard of these in the news. Um, stem cells reside in different places in our body and they replenish and replace our dying cells. Some people s will say that you are born with as many stem cells as you will die with. And as an example, we have immune stem cells, so when our immune system needs replacing and replenishing, our stem cells will create daughter cells, as they're called. We have the same in the muscle and the bone and the intestine. And an interesting fact, your intestinal tract is replaced every three days by stem cells. So if we looked at this in the bone, what we have is this constant cycle of bone turnover. Um, and in Paget's disease, this cycle is effectively sped up. So if we start with the osteoclast cells down here, so you may have heard that these are the cells that break down bone. So when the bone needs to be broken down, uh, immune stem cells, funny enough, uh, osteoclasts actually belong to the immune system, Immune stem cells will start to produce these osteoclasts, which then cause bone resorption, so they break the bone down. And then this causes bone stem cells to produce osteoblasts, which will then go on to form bone. And this constant cycle goes round and round and round for our entire lives. In Paget's disease, something interrupts this process, and actually what we get is a much faster turnaround of this cycle. Obviously, as this cycle goes round, every time osteoblast cells need to produce bone, the stem cells, the bone stem cells, uh, need to produce osteoblasts uh, a bit quicker than normal. 
Now, because of this, we're not sure why, in some circumstances, this can cause a cell to go a little bit wrong, and then further changes down the line can actually produce uh, cancer cells. And this is what we think is happening in Paget's uh, associated osteosarcoma. So just a few key facts. As I said, Paget's associated osteosarcoma, that's the name of the bone cancer. It is very rare and it is getting even rarer uh, with the treatments that we give out today. So that leads on to my next point. So uh, zoledronate reduces the likelihood of osteosarcoma development. And you may have heard this term, prevention is better than cure. But if we do get osteosarcoma, which I should mention is actually a, a childhood bone cancer, the treatment for once you get it hasn't improved since conventional chemotherapy was introduced in the 1980s. So the original chemotherapy was actually developed around the World War II, but it was introduced for a wide range of tumours in the 80s, and there is no new uh, treatment since those days. So how does the cancer treatment work? So we would first of all try to employ surgery, so we want to remove the tumour from the body. Chemotherapy, as you know, is the use of different types of drugs, but they're very nasty drugs, they're toxic substances to kill any fast-growing cells in our body. And radiotherapy is the use of radiation to kill cells in a selected area. You may have seen in the news that some new uh, treatments that are coming to light is immunotherapy. So this is where we try to retrain the immune system to destroy cancer cells in our body. Gene editing is a really exciting area of science at the moment where we can cut out and replace damaged bits of DNA with um, the newer versions. And a lot of exciting work that's going on in Norwich, which is where we're from, they're looking at diet and chemicals that are in the diet that can prevent and treat cancer. Now this slide makes me laugh because it's very true how cancer treatment works. If you imagine a computer that has broken down, classic chemotherapy is a doctor comes along and hits the computer with a hammer and hopes that the problem is going to go away. But in doing that, it's going to cause a lot of injury to the computer or the person. So is it not much better to get an engineer in to pick apart the computer and find out what exactly has gone wrong and maybe we can fix it? And this is what leads on to our research, and this is exactly what we're doing in Bill Fraser's lab in Norwich. If we take a standard cell, we can see that we, have, we start with the DNA, and we can picture that DNA as like a blueprint, which makes us who we are. We have RNA in the middle, and we can imagine that as like a, a notepad with a few um, notes jotted on, and I've just added TP53 there, which is the name of a very important human gene. We have microRNAs, which are shorter versions of these RNA, but they act more like erasers or rubbers to rub out these instructions when we don't need them. And then we come on to the protein, and these proteins are like the tools that go on to, um, to do whatever our body needs them to do. And these tools can either go back into the cell to play around with the DNA, the microRNAs and the RNA, or the protein can leave the cell and go and do its job elsewhere in the body. Now what our research focuses on, um, you may have heard Rob was talking that he likes to study these proteins and this is where his interest is in. We're just one further step back, so we like to look at the RNA and the microRNAs. And in some of our other work, which we're trying to get published at the moment, we know that if we can find problems with RNA and we try to fix that faulty RNA, then we do see some better treatments perhaps. So this is a microscope image of some work that we've done. On the left here is a bone cancer, it's a different type of bone cancer to osteosarcoma, but each of these blue dots is a cell, and inside these uh, blue dots is the DNA. Now this is the bone tumour on its own, it's had no treatment given to it. When we investigate the RNA and we try to fix the RNA, we actually see that the cell number has vastly reduced, and the actual size of the cell itself has shrunk in half. So we know that fixing the RNA does have some potential here. So this is what the Alan Reed bursary was funded, was funded for. We wanted to investigate the RNA of Paget's associated osteosarcoma to see if we could improve the treatment or at least find a marker for its development. As you saw earlier, Alan went through five months of being told that they couldn't find what was wrong with him. So we had uh, a small number of samples. We managed to collect five normal bones. We collected four uh, pagetic bones. You can see the difference in the Paget's disease here to the normal bone and we sourced two samples of uh, the osteosarcoma. So we used new technology that we developed in Norwich to be able to profile the RNA in these cancer samples. And what was really cool was that we found a molecule called microRNA16, or MIR16 for short, was very highly expressed in the osteosarcoma, but it was barely visible at all in the Paget's disease. 
So if we look here on the left hand side, these are our control samples, so these are what we would call the normal bone. If we look at Paget's disease in the middle, this is the expression of MIR-16, so it's barely visible at all. And then in the osteosarcoma sample, we see that it's very, very highly expressed. Now with some other work that we were doing, and we employed some computer modelling and uh, used special biological software, we know that MIR-16 directly interacts with sequestrosome 1. We know that MIR-16 blocks the expression of sequestrosome 1. Now, in Paget's, you might think this is a good thing. If sequestrosome 1 is mutated in your Paget's disease, then surely we want to wipe out that protein. Sequestrosome 1, funny enough, actually has many other cellular roles. And one of the big uh, important cellular roles of sequestrosome 1 is that it protects the DNA from damage. And DNA damage can cause diseases such as cancer. If MIR-16 is not very highly expressed, then sequestrosome 1 is allowed to go and cause its problems in bone turnover, but when we turn MIR-16 up high, it's turning off sequestrosome 1 completely. Sequestrosome 1 can't defend the DNA, and then we get um, problems like cancer. So the importance of this work, the switch in MIR-16 expression could alert physicians to the development of something sinister. So at the minute, we would use alkaline phosphatase to monitor your Paget's disease, but this is the same molecule that we would see in osteosarcoma. At what point do we say that your Paget's has turned into something a bit worse, or we don't want to frighten patients and say this looks like osteosarcoma when it's not. As uh, we did see earlier, Alan's readings were 24 times higher than normal before it was even contemplated that he had uh, the cancerous change. Now future work could um, employ the use of synthetic RNA molecules or RNA blockers. So if we want to prevent MIR-16 from being highly expressed and perhaps causing the tumour, we can develop new drugs to target that molecule. If you want to see the paper, um, please contact me. Um, it was published in quite a good endocrine-related uh, journal. For future work, obviously, we need to investigate this in a bigger cohort of patients. So as you remember, we only had five normal samples, four pagetic samples, and two cancer samples. So we will need to investigate this further and further samples. But as you know, the osteosarcoma is getting rarer, so it will be a bit tougher for us to find these samples. However, again, we, there may be other microRNAs that are involved. There's two and a half thousand different microRNAs in the human genome. We're, we've only found the expression of one that was potentially showing some interesting things. We also know that some other genes may be involved in the osteosarcoma development. So sequestrosome 1 is only one of nine genes that's currently published to be faulty in Paget's disease. The samples that we looked at had mutations for sequestrosome 1, but they may have mutations in other genes. Obviously, I can't do this work alone. Uh, I thank uh, Professor Bill Fraser, who's sitting at the back. I feel very fortunate to be working in his lab. He's been of huge support to me. Uh, Tamas Dalme, where we do the RNA work, and Irina here has helped me with some of the microRNA work. Ian McManara at the Norwich Hospital, who found our control samples. I'd also like to thank Michael Davey at the back, for he, we sourced some pagetic bone in the osteosarcoma samples. And last but not least, uh, Alan's family for raising the money that enabled these findings to be uh, to published and shown. I'm sad and delighted to be here today for two reasons. Uh, today is quite special for me because a year ago today, my father passed away. But he was 95 and he was very, very proud of his association with the Padgett's Association. And in his latter years, in his 90s, I often drove him, be it to Norwich or wherever, and uh, he loved every minute of it. Um, and he was very, very proud of his association with Paget's Association. Whether I can go as far as 95 years, I somewhat doubt, um, but I will endeavour to do as many as I, I possibly can. My sister and I, sadly my sister couldn't be here today, but uh, are very pleased to set up the bursary and to do the first year. Uh, the recipient for the year, uh, forgive me if I'm a little bit biased, but she was born, if she doesn't mind me saying, in the James Paget Hospital in Great Yarmouth. So she has a head start anyway, uh, destined for great things. Uh, and we all, I know, would like to wish her a very happy and uh, successful career. Jasmine. So we're investigating um, osteosarcoma. 
So Paget's disease can trigger a change in the, de the development of one of the main types of bone cells called an osteoblast into a cancerous cell. So this is very rare, so it occurs in less than 0.1% of Paget's patients. However, we don't know the like, molecular basis of, of it yet. So we hope with the bursary that we're going to find out more about it. So humans have around 20,000 genes, and it's likely that nine cause Paget's disease. However, this <coughs> can increase in the future. So all these genes have a role in bone turn turnover, and our hypothesis that one of these genes or a combination of these genes can lead to osteosarcoma. One of the genes is sequestosome 1, and this is present in patients with osteosarcoma associated with Paget's disease. So when it's so pe people with a fault in this gene often have an earlier onset and also a more severe form. So it affects a larger majority of the skeleton. So sequestosome one can protect DNA from damage. So without sequestosome one, DNA damage is likely to cause diseases such as cancer. So previous research showed that microRNA-16 was highly expressed in projects associated with osteosarcoma. So microRNA acts as an eraser to, um, so no protein is produced. So without sequestosome one, it's likely to be DNA is likely to be compromised, which could lead to cancer. So with the bursary, our objective is to find out which of the Paget's genes um, are linked to osteosarcoma development. So this will be achieved by <coughs> collecting samples from the Ro Royal, Orthopedic Surgery, uh, Royal Orthopedic Hospital in Barrio, which is the main, um, the largest site for bone cancer surgery. So we will identify the mutations in nine of the genes and then use next generation sequencing to find the mutations in these genes and work out exactly where it's gone wrong. So this is a faster and cheaper method than previous methods used before and it is when multiple sections of DNA is read um, and then obviously the mutations are found. In the future, this could lead to earlier intervention, so possibly a more um, chance of survival and also a more personalised treatment as well by new technologies such as genome editing, which replaces the faulty mutation with a healthy mutation. I want to say thank you for the Paget Association for the funding, also my supervisors, Professor William Fraser and Dr Darrell Green. Just a word uh, uh, about the, uh, the presentation. Uh, I, I'm fortunate to be chairman of an organisation that was set, set up specifically to, research, uh, to fund research into bone because uh, in the time I was involved with bone, it was, often, it was often very difficult to find money for bone research, being rather a Cinderella uh, of the sciences. So we're very pleased to be able to, 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 to fund these awards. Uh, on this occasion, it, it's of interest, I just learnt uh, over lunch that uh, th 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 not only uh, is Paget's disease inherited, but also the re 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 research into Paget's disease is inherited, as uh, Jack Beard is, uh, uh, is re re reticulated to uh, a notable member of the Paget's Association, so it's not just the disease but the, in, the, the research. So I'm very pleased to be able to, uh, to, to give the award to, to, James, to James Edwards, wherever he may be, uh, to congratulate him or his student on not writing the appropriate uh, request. Well done, there we are. Thank you very much. And all the best, and we look forward to, to hearing perhaps the next Paget's meeting, how it's gone. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. I thought I'd just say a very short little bit about, about Jack and about the, the research that we plan to do. Uh, as you know from your 
programs. He was intending to come here and, and to do a, a presentation for you. He will come, but it's going to have to be at, a, at another date. We won't let him uh, skip out on that. Uh, Jack is a, a lovely and energetic and en enthusiastic undergraduate who got in touch with us uh, with an interest in doing uh, musculoskeletal research. He's currently doing an undergraduate degree in biomedical science at Nottingham. Uh, but these days it's so hard to try and find good PhD positions that he knew that he needed to really try and get as much experience under his belt as, as possible. So he came and, and had the intention of, of coming and, and working with us, which is what he did for a little bit. And what we then were able to do is to write this award to try and move that a little bit further forward with, for him. So my group studies musculoskeletal aging. We're interested in lifespan and longevity related factors, and particularly how a dysregulation of these things that control how long we live leads to early onset of a number of musculoskeletal diseases and Paget's diseases included within that. One of these aging related factors is known as autophagy, and it's the cellular's mechanism for getting rid of garbage unwanted proteins or proteins which haven't formed quite right. And what tends to happen with aging is that this process becomes defective. And what uh, Graham Russell quite accurately describes it as is cellular indigestion. The cells just get clogged up with all of this gunk. So what Jack's going to do is investigate this process because it's very closely linked by sequestrosome 1, which is one of the factors which is linked with Paget's disease and which we heard a little bit about this morning and whether autophagy itself can be controlled by the bisphosphonate class of drugs, which you also heard about this morning as well. So in the coming years or so, I'm sure you'll see Jack here talking about some of this. And thanks again to the Paget Society and for uh, Michael Davy for this award. Thank you very much. As Dr. Davy did mention the uh, familial tendency for research, I perhaps should say that um, Jack is, is Professor Graham Russell's grandson, but I have to underline that there's no suggestion of nepotism. These um, applications are, are assessed very rigorously, and um, you know, Jack is fully deserving the award, irrespective of his distinguished uh, pedigree, shall we say. So um, we wish uh, Jack all the best in the future with his research. Right, any questions either for Bill or for any of the speakers today? So, uh, in, in theory, this, this thought struck me when Mike's presentation was earlier this morning. The isotope bone scan slides, if I've got that right, uh, are extremely impressive. They're a kind of um, emphatic visual document that, when presented to a patient, or in my case, a carer, um, really gets the message home. I hesitate to say they're reassuring, but at least we know what we're dealing with. Uh, I guess a couple of thoughts for really from a, a carer, because my mother has this uh, condition and Mike is currently looking after her. So can a patient and or a carer get a copy of those visual documents? Because it strikes me that when my mother's with a GP trying to explain what her other conditions are, she often defaults into saying it's Paget's and the GP's off the hook. So I think it's something that uh, would be really helpful for patients and carers, uh, particularly when they get you know, past 80 years old, when there are other conditions that we were talking about earlier uh, inevitably there. So the other thing that strikes me is that having got a copy of it, um, whenever she or others are with the GP, it raises the awareness of Paget's. Mike, do you want to take that? Yeah, no, you can. you can. You could send a copy. You could print off a copy. That's perfectly possible. Um, we, do it, we do it with other imaging. Um, we do it with bone density scans and osteoporosis. People quite often like a copy of that. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Increasingly, these things are available electronically. Um, certainly in Cardiff and around there, you can get it already. The GP can access the images. So you could just ask the GP to look at them. But yeah, you could do that. I mean, the counter-argument is what's the GP going to do with it mm. and how good are they at interpreting them? And when you print off a picture, it's not as good as the electronic images. But yeah, I think in general, it's such a graphic depiction of what it's all about. Um, yeah, I, I would be quite happy to do that. Any other comments or questions? In the coming year, there is uh, a proposal that's going through whether the 
the current government will now support it, that all results should be made available to patients. Yeah. So everything, your blood tests, x-rays, uh, anything that you have done will be made available to the patients. In yeah. fact, there are some of us who say it should be made mandatory that the yeah. patients get them, because very often I don't hear there's an abnormality until the poor patient does get the result <laughs> somehow. So, yeah, okay. that's, that's going to happen in the next year. I think it's inevitable, yeah, absolutely. Any other comments or questions? I'm sure you must have burning questions. It's worth mentioning, if you think of something afterwards, you can always uh, contact Diana uh, at the office, either a helpline or email, and even if she can't answer, which is unlikely, she could put it to one of us. So, you know, we will deal with your queries um, one way or another, whatever happens. I wasn't going to say anything, but I've just written it on there. No one's mentioned the gene, um, the interest in genes uh, of Paget's disease. I've had tests at Manchester Royal Hospital about carrying the gene into the family, and I haven't heard anything mentioned today about that. Well, in fact, there has been something. I mean, Bill, at the end, I, I was rushing him, so he made oh, sure he right. finished at times. The last study then. he mentioned, the ZIP study, is looking at people who've got the genetic predisposition and seeing whether zeledronate uh, can actually prevent that. I think that's a fair summary, isn't it, Bill? That's, that's right. The uh, the ZIP study, problem, you, you were probably in the ZIP study, so you were, you were sampled. If you carried the sequestrosome gene, then we would have asked that your children, were they willing to come forward? If the children came forward and were tested positive for that sequestrosome gene, they were then put into the next bit of the study where one half had been given zoledronate and the other half were given a placebo. That study has been going now for about five years, and we're just about to look at some of the initial data and, and see it was closed mm. out three years ago in terms of recruitment, but it's ongoing. Mm. And uh, what we hope to do, of course, is to get further funding to take it out to 10 yeah. years, because it may be that is the length of time we need to go to mm. before we actually start to see lesions. Mm. And although Peter was very impressed by the, uh, the bone scans, when the lesions are very early, it can be very difficult to see them on a bone scan. And so one of the things we're doing in that study is repeating the bone scans to see wh what is the earliest point of time that we might actually see the lesions appear in, in the study. Hopefully the lesions don't appear in the zoledronate-treated mm. group and they, they might appear in the placebo-treated group, but we don't know. Yeah. We, we will need to see. Hopefully we'll hear about these in future meetings, uh, future annual general meetings. It's also worthwhile mentioning that one of the research projects we funded this year is looking further into genetic causes of Paget's disease, and that's work funded at, in Edinburgh University by Omar Albago, who's uh, one of Stuart Ralston's colleagues. Any other comments, questions? Um, could somebody tell me what an intravenous A-C-L-A-S-I-A -A -A is? A cluster. That's zoledronic. Yeah, cluster. That's, that's zoledronic acid. That's zoledronic, zoledronic acid. A cluster is its... Trade name. name trade name. Like. Okay, so what does it mean in, in the language we've been hearing today? Zoledronic. It's the most potent of the, it's the, the most treatments. Potent. It's the yeah. zole zoledronic acid. Is a cluster. Thank you. Okay. And could you also, last question, could you tell me what should your blood levels be normally if you've got Paget's disease? As against 438, I'll, 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 I'll and then you have one of these. It depends what the reference down. range is because different labs use different ways of measuring alkaline phosphatase. Uh, so in my lab, the top end would be 126, so 400 would be four times normal. But in some labs, that might be a normal value if they use a different type of measurement process. So you've got to know what the lab's doing. There are very few labs where 120, 130 is not the top end, but I've seen some mm. labs throughout the country that report in different units. And there is, there is a range 
of, of units that goes up to about 500, 600, and 400 would be normal. In well, I had that before. I had the thingy which brought it down to 73. So I think so it, was it sounds abnormal. like 126 or 130 mm, yeah. is the top end, and 70 or 36. So that's in the reference range. So you've responded well to treatment. 